Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Faro coming to you from Johannesburg. On Saturday, the 8th November 2014, in the early hours of the morning, South Africa's major trade union federation, COSATU, expelled its biggest affiliate, NUMSA. Now, NUMSA's expulsion has been brewing for some time now. NUMSA's expulsion is linked to the factionalism inside COSATU. But long before these issues came to the public's attention, way back in March 2012, I interviewed Ixan Schroeder of the Casual Workers Advice Office, who said that Kosatu's demise was on the cards. Back then, when I interviewed Ixan, he said Kosatu's demise was probably going to come along in 15 years' time. That was more than two years ago. I interviewed him shortly after the Marikana massacre and he revised his prediction saying he doesn't give Kosatu another five years. Well, here we are, just over two years later, and it seems Ixan's prediction is coming true. Kosatu seems to be unraveling much faster than any of us would have imagined or could have imagined. Welcome to Saxes, Ixan. Hi, thanks for having me. This is something that you predicted long before anybody else. Um, and I was wondering, given the current situation with NUMSA being expelled from Kasatu, um, what do you think of what's going on? Um, can you reflect on especially recent happenings? What's the meaning of NUMSA's expulsion from Kasatu now today? Well, I think the, the first thing is that it's as you said in the introduction, this unraveling has been taking place for quite some time now. Um, so, you know, the None of us could have predicted how exactly Kasatu would sort of formally unravel. But the process of the collapse of the organization has been going on for some years now. And Marikana was a very graphic exp expression of that collapse of Kasatu and its disintegration. I think what we're seeing with the, you know, with the, with the NUMSA expulsion is the more, almost the more formal side of the kind of, the detail almost of the kind of formal unraveling of the Federation. Um, and because you must bear in mind that although the Federation seems to be now split down the middle as everybody reports, in both camps, uh, the camp that is supporting NUMSA and in the camp that is opposing NUMSA, in both camps there are unions that are really on their knees. You know, if you take a union like Sepau, for example, the, it was issued with a, a deregistration notice. So it was going to be deregistered at the end of September. If you take some of the big unions in the bloc that's uh, supporting NUMSA, like SAMU, in a court case in September, the judge found that the leadership effectively uh, was responsible for the disappearance of something like 136 million rand. And there's a big fight in the union at the moment. So. You know, this process has been going on and what, at some level, the expulsion of NUMSA, in a way, almost, you know, uh, although everyone talks about, you know, the, what this means and its significance, in some ways it almost hides the real story. Because if you look at NUMSA's expulsion, the reason given for its expulsion is that it called for the break with ANC and that it's begun to poach members of other unions. So it can give the impression that it's a, you know, that the difference in Kasatu is a political one, that the real problem or the underlying basis for its collapse is this disagreement over the question of support for the ANC or non-support for the ANC. But in reality, that's not really what is going down here. Um, that's the immediate reason for NUMSA's expulsion. Um, but in reality, these unions have been in a state of decay and decline for some time now. And this simply is a one more confirmation of that. Um, so if you look at the General Secretary's report to the CEC, for example, it's the CEC that has just sat. He mentions in his report that at least seven affiliates were riven completely with factionalism, with problems of corruption. Um, and generally his tone in his report is that the Federation is dysfunctional. If you look, compare that report to the report he tabled in 2012, in the Congress of 2012, it's much the theme is the same, and that's long before the expulsion of NUMSA. So in many ways this is really a confirmation of that long process. And what it might well do 
it may it may formalize you know it might accelerate the formal collapse of the federation but that process has been in, 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 in progress for some time now it is interesting watching this thing from the outside um, and what's you know Kosato has played such an important role um, in society and in oh. politics in general in South Africa what does this mean now that it's starting to unravel like this? It depends on what perspective you want to take on that. I think from the point of view of ordinary workers, it's not going to mean much. Kasato has long ceased to represent ordinary blue-collar workers. You know, the sort of lowest paid workers, the workers, the labor broker workers, your contract workers. Kasato has long ceased to represent those workers and that's been part of the, you know, the process of its unraveling. Um, is that it's become a middle-class organization that in a way masquerades as a, as a trade union. You know. uh, on South African politics though? On South African politics, Kasato has been the voice of the middle classes even at the level of, of South African politics. If you take the issues that it has taken up, you know, uh, it's taken up the question of e-tolling. At the same time as it takes up the issue of e-tolling, there's been a million jobs lost. And yet it didn't take up a campaign, you know, in defense of a, of a million workers who lost their jobs. So the issues that Kusato has chosen to take up is a reflection of that. I mean, if you take now the changes made to the legislation in August of this year, the state has made major legislative changes giving important new rights to precarious workers, to labor broker workers, to contract workers, part-time workers and so on. The Labour Kasatu has been dead, dead quiet about any of that. There's no question that Kasatu is going to start a campaign of mass awareness raising amongst these workers or anything like that. But Kasatu can comment on the fight, you know, at Generations, you know, the, the soapy soap drama, you know, it can, it can comment on, 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 on things like that. Because that's become the style of Kasatu's politics. It is a, you know, a, an opinion maker, or whatever you want to call these funny names. Um, it's not really a fighting formation any longer. It makes statements, it uh, takes on poses, uh, and that's about it. Look, Alliance politics seems to have played a big role in what has happened. But what do you make of the fact that the ANC did actually say that it's a tragedy that Nomsa got ex expelled from Kosato? Look, I'm not, you know, the. The, the alliance politics, the question of the ANC and support of the ANC was clearly one of the sort of factors that led to, to NUMSA's ultimate expulsion and the fact that NUMSA was intransigent on that question, for which I think it must be commended, certainly. The, so that was certainly a factor. The fact that the ANC can piously now say, you know, it's a, you know, it's a pity that Kasa and NUMSA has left, is a, is a reflection of an understanding of the role that Kasatu's played. I mean, the point you were alluding to earlier, just before this, about Kasatu's role in South African politics. If you boil it down to its real essence, I mean, the role that Kasatu's played has been to, you know, to sort of, in a way, camouflage the real class character of the ANC. Kasatu, in this election we had this year, you know, Kasatu still peddles the idea that the ANC is the only vehicle through which the working class is going to realize its, its, uh, its interests. And that's the real role of Kasatu in South African politics. It disguises, you know, the real agenda of the real ruling class, and by that I don't mean the ANC, I mean big business. It disguises the role that Kasatu play, uh, the ANC plays in furthering the, the agenda of the real ruling class. And... Um, to that extent, you know, the, the expulsion of NUMSA, the question mark now against the future of Kasatu doesn't suit the ruling class agenda at all. Because the role that Kasatu plays is to disarm, you know, and to demobilize and to confuse politically. So instead of the working class arriving at greater, instead of Kasatu contributing to a process of the working class arriving at a greater clarity about the true class nature of the ANC, that it's really a party of big business. Kasatu does the opposite. It obfuscates, it confuses, and it misleads. So that is the source of the ANC disquiet that, that NUMSA has left. It's not that they're concerned about Kasatu now no longer being a fighting formation, taking up the issues of ordinary workers. That's not the concern. It, uh, it's a bit of a setback for the real ruling class agenda, in my opinion. So there have been reports now that NUMSA is going to appeal this expulsion. What do you think of that? NUMSA was never wanting to leave Kasatu. 
you know, at a special congress, Numsa was very, very clear. There was no question of, li- of it leaving Kasatu. And um, I think the, you know, the, the legal route is in line, firstly, with that position that it had, that it didn't want to leave Kasatu. The strategy is also in line with the, you know, the sort of the taking Kasatu to court around Vavi's suspension. Um, so I'm not surprised by any of those. The question, of course, is that if, Kasa, if NUMSA does get reinstated into Kasatu, which is, I think, unlikely from, even from a legal point of view, even if it does get put back into Kasatu, even if the expulsion is overturned, I think the divisions now are so deep-seated that I can't see that Kasatu would at any point in the future cohere either politically, but even if it coheres politically, organizationally it doesn't exist. There's no Kasatu. You know. So I don't think the NUMSA being put back into Kasatu is going to make any real difference to the future of Kasatu. It's a, it's a house of cards. Are they on the right path, though, to be challenging this expulsion? I think NUMSA has the responsibility, probably, to, you know, to demonstrate actively to the rest of the working class that it is serious about worker unity. It doesn't want to break whatever workers might be left in the Federation or, you know, the extent that the Federation might still represent, you know, uh, workers' interests. I think it's correct in demonstrating that it never wanted to leave Kasatu. I think tactically that is correct. I think what is far more important is what NUMSA now does. I think for the working class, for workers more narrowly defined, I think what NUMSA does next is going to be much more important. We're sitting in a very fluid period. I think that's been the case long before NUMSA's expulsion. Uh, Marikana was a, a very graphic expression of the fluidity of the old labor movement being exposed as being a sweetheart movement and collapsing. But I think the working class is in a process of still trying to discover what do we put in its place. Do we just make new unions or do we try and find new ways of organizing through these worker committees, the farm committees and so on. So in a very fluid period in our, in our, certainly in our labor history, in a very fluid period. Let's turn back to Kasatu again. Um, NUMSA was a big supporter of its embattled leader, um, Svelin Zima Vavi. With them being expelled, what, does this, what do you think this means for his future inside Kasatu? I don't think he has a future. I think he has to decide either to resign or he's going to be kicked out. I don't think there's any other way that we can see that one working out. Um, I think the, you know, the, the battle lines have been drawn so sharply already um, that there's no question of, despite his attempt, post his uh, reinstatement, to keep a very low profile, to not be particularly sort of contentious um, or controversial, not too critical, despite that attempt, I think. Uh, I think the die has been cast. And as I say, if he doesn't resign, he's going to be dismissed around this disciplinary inquiry that's sort of hanging over him. There's still the outstanding question of the corruption charges against him, uh, which still has to be finalized as well. And I think, you know, the, the misconduct um, and the, this, these, and this investigation around his corruption, alleged corruption, I think between those two, the, between those two there'll be sufficient basis for, the, for him to be dismissed. Um, so I think that's most likely what's going to happen if he doesn't resign before that. So, since you're so good at predictions, <laughs> yeah, let's talk a little bit about what you think about the South African labor movement in a decade from now. Where do you see it? I think our focus must increasingly be the self-organizing initiatives of workers. For me, that's where the focus must be. And, and that's what I am saying also is, if NUMSA doesn't see that at its future, then there's going to be a brief period where NUMSA might emerge really strong and the preeminent organization, and then it too will go down the route of, of all these other unions. So for me, the, you know, the, I don't think there's much to lament about the collapse of Kasatu. And I think when we spoke in March, my attitude was the sooner an organization like Kasatu collapses, the clearer the political tasks will become for ordinary workers. I think we're reaching, we've reached that point, 
And in fact, we were sort of well on the road to workers beginning to organize themselves. And that self-organization for me is what holds the key for where the labor movement is going to go. Now, I was, again, I want to stress, I think we're in this very fluid transitional period. Some workers are taking the route of, they've been in these unions, if you take the AMCO experience, you know, workers were in NUM, they left NUM, they've gone to AMCO. Already we've heard the rumblings of discontent in AMCO that in many ways the organization is undemocratic and unaccountable, the leadership, etc. you know. So already even in AMCO there are these rumblings of workers wanting to move out. The, um, we've seen workers leave their unions and form independent committees. That was very much the Marikana experience. We've seen how the massive farm worker strike was, was cut through these independent farm worker committees. So there's a, this kind of messy combination of independent initiatives, but in some cases, workers still, even though they're tired of their existing union, they still want to form new unions. I think that's still very much part of this transitional period that we're going through. That workers are testing out for themselves um, what works and what doesn't work. And we could see in the next five to ten years, however long, we're going to see this kind of messy combination of these different forms of organisation. Some workers are going to try and form the old traditional union again and maybe discover maybe it works better than others, maybe they might discover actually the thing doesn't work. The problems are far deeper seated than just the leadership being corrupt, that this, this fighting tool is no longer sufficient against the bosses. Um, so I think in this next period we're going to see far more workers self-initiatives. And I think the important point is going to be the extent to which we take those seriously, we draw, try and draw the gender lessons from them, and see to what extent some of that experience can be generalized. And we're going to have side by side with that. We're going to have still these old trade union forms like the industrial unions. So it's going to be a very, very messy period. Um, I think maybe by the end of that 10 years, it will be a bit clearer, you know, what is the replacement for these old, industri old industrial trade unions? Um, we might have institutions like the CCMA that maybe look very, very different. I mean, if you just take a practical example, historically the CCMA is not allowed institutions other, from the worker side, institutions other than registered trade unions to represent workers. Now with the emergence of these farm committees and work, worker committees in workplaces that are not taking that traditional form of a registered trade union, the CCMA has a challenge of does it admit institutions like those to come and represent workers because they are the, the actual representatives of these workers in these workplaces. Does it permit organizations like that to begin to come and represent workers? Even the whole LRA framework, the model that's ingrained in the Labor Relations Act in terms of forms of worker representation is very much that old industrial trade union model. And although there's been, um, there've been amendments made now, those amendments even, are very much along the lines of allowing minority unions representation, but it's still based on this model of the, of the trade union, of the industrial trade union. I think we're going to see that, that that sort of framework that the LRA sets up for forms of worker representation, worker bargaining, and forms of bargaining, institutions of bargaining, those will have to change. If they don't, all the pulling out of hair on the side of employers and the state about violence that attends these strikes and so on, they will remain. Um, because the problem is not just tightening up strike violence. It's a reflection of this transitional period that the old framework has finished, doesn't work. So I think we're going to see something, you know, down the line, we're going to see a very different form of organization to what we have now. I think we're going to see very different institutions to which workers bargain. Um, the CCMA, I think, will look quite different in how it functions and who can come there and who can't come there. And uh, depending on the intensity of struggles that workers can mount in their own defense, a labor law that will look very different, that will reflect these changed forms of organization, um, mediating institutions, um, bargaining institutions, I think it will look quite, quite different. Ixan Schroeder, thank you very much for joining us at Saxis. Thanks for having me. Cool. Bye.
And thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service. And remember, if you want more social justice news and analysis, you can get that at saxis.org.za.